Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, well, I've got a big topic here, uh, voluntary city and mutual aid societies. I'm not going to be talking a heck of a lot about the voluntary city as a whole, although if you, if you want to buy the book, I'll be happy to sign it. We've got chapters in there uh, focusing on history, but also some more recent stuff about the voluntary provision of almost everything, including social welfare, including uh, streets, sewers, long distance highways. We have some real life historical examples. What I'm going to be talking about today is fraternal organizations, but let me set the context first and go back a hundred years, uh, 1910 roughly, and uh, if we could just go forward one. Uh, we have we talked today about uh, 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 our problems with uh, the welfare state and poverty and that kind of thing. Uh, these aren't anything compared to what people faced 100 years ago. You have millions of immigrants flowing into the large cities of the United States. Um, they, they tend to have lower levels of education, high illiteracy rates, right? And you have virtually free immigration as well. Right? A lot of people say, well, my ancestors they came legally. Well, it was possible for just about anybody to come legally, unless you were Chinese or something like that, or had a communicable disease. So you have all these people flowing into the cities. Um, you also have, well, if you go to the next, and they're coming from Eastern and Southern Europe. Give you a sense of what we're talking about here. 1910, that's the uh, percentage of the U.S. population that's foreign born. That's gone up again over the last few years. So you've got a wave of immigration, of very poor people flocking into the largest cities of the United States. Many of them cannot speak English. You've also got a second wave of people coming up from, just beginning to come up from the American South into northern cities and southern cities. Again, although they can speak the language, high levels of illiteracy, uh, unskilled labor, that kind of thing. Um, so you've got a lot of poor people. Uh, this is an era, a hundred years ago, where people aren't counting everything like they count everything now. Most Americans are not aware of what the uh, CPI is. They're not aware of what the unemployment rate is. They don't care about that. They're not aware of what the poverty rate is. But if historians look back, their estimate is maybe you're talking about 40% of the population would fall under the poverty line, I guess, by today's standards. Yet, people are not all dropping dead. Uh, they're somehow surviving, and what we also see is a lot of these immigrants are moving up the ladder, up the housing ladder. Poles are, for example, more likely to own their own homes than native-born Americans by the 1920s, but we see this in general, people moving up and moving out. Okay, why are they doing that? Well, if you go to the next slide, I, I'm not going to be able to talk about this, but if I were to have an opportunity, I would say, much, most of it has to do, does not have anything to do with the role of welfare. It has the role, role of opportunity. Right? In American cities, there, there are virtually no building codes, there are no zoning laws. Right? So people can double up or triple up, they can save on rent. Uh, if you want to become a peddler, you can become a peddler and earn some income. If you want to work in your home, you can do that. And immigrants have all sorts of survival strategies provided by the fact that you have an open market which allows a lot of experimentation. So this explains, help, helps explains why, why, why even though people are starting in desperate poverty, you don't have a lot of Jews uh, still living on the Lower East Side of New York in poverty, right? Even though that was where they started out. There is virtually, so that I think is the prime explanation, but still you have a lot of poor people, or a lot, some people are going to fall between the cracks. What do you have in terms of social welfare a hundred years ago? Well, you really don't have a welfare state at all. The closest you have to it is governmental uh, indoor relief, meaning you have to go in an institution, uh, an alms house or a poor house to get relief if you're down and out, if you want to get government aid. These are decentralized, mainly provided on the county level, and there have been several books written about them, and in some sense I think too much attention has been paid to them. Because how many Americans are you talking about that are in the leading form of governmental relief? In 1880, one out of every 700 Americans at any one time is in an almshouse. One out of every 700 Americans. And even though we have this wave of immigration, even though we have the growth of these large cities, even though we have all of these exposés of poverty 
Now, how terrible things are, by 1920, that amount is actually widened to one out of every 900 Americans is in an almshouse. If you were to look at organized private charity, bureaucratic top-down private charity, you're talking about similar numbers, right? In a population where you might have a poverty rate of 40 percent. All right, so what happens to people be between the cracks? Let's go on to the next slide. They form associations, associations based on reciprocity, right? On mutual aid. And uh, this is part of a general trend that is identified uh, in American history. Uh, Tocqueville came to the United States to study American prisons and ended up writing about everything, including the American habit of forming associations. Right? He said, in England, you're going to rely on a man of rank. In France, you'll, be, uh, you'll rely on the government. But in the United States, Americans of all ages, all conditions, and all dispositions constantly form associations. And he has a long list of associations they form. With reference to social welfare, the, the kind of association I want to focus on is fraternal societies. And if you go to the next one, when people think about fraternal societies, often they have these images that come to mind. If you, from my generation, you remember watching, at least in reruns, the Honeymooners with Ralph Cramden and Ed Norton, and they belong to a fraternal society, the Loyal Order of Raccoons. So there they are, right? Uh, more recent examples go on. The Flintstones, Loyal Order of Water Buffaloes, let's, let's beat this into the ground. The Simpsons, the Stonecutters. But the image that you have of fraternal societies now is a bunch of, you know, middle-aged or elderly guys dropping water balloons out of windows at conventions, trying to get away from their wives, acting silly, right? Or some sort of ritual and mumbo-jumbo. Well, if we look at fraternal societies during the late 19th, early 20th centuries, they are uh, doing a lot more than that. First, these are cooperative organizations. They are organ and decentralized into lodges. So a large society might have thousands of lodges in some cases um, throughout the United States and to varying degrees. These are locally financed, locally run membership or leaders are elected from the ranks of the members. Right? There are multi-class organizations, which a lot of historians don't want to that's why one of the reasons they don't talk about them is you have rich people and poor people in them all working together in, for, in these organizations. They have uh, rituals, um, typically, and uh, part of that is entertainment, right? To do this long, these long ritualistic exercises and dress up in funny costumes. But part of it is, is that these are insurance organizations in many cases. So it's a way to test the solidarity of the members. Are you willing to take our organization seriously? We have all of these, these rituals, right? And then, of course, the thing I want to focus on, and of course, part of what the rituals do is they teach moral lessons. They teach lessons about self-help, about loyalty, uh, about things that we may not necessarily care for, patriotism, the American flag. They teach uh, fidelity. They teach all sorts of lessons, moral lessons. And again, these are mutual aid organizations, and I would distinguish them from charities. In fact, they distinguish themselves from charities. So don't call us a charitable organization. We are based on mutual aid. We are based on reciprocity, meaning I could be giving aid one day and getting aid the next. We're on a relatively equal plane, where if you look at private charities, they tend to be, in government, they tend to be top down. And there's very little relationship between the person giving the aid and the person receiving it. Some sense about, uh, 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 well, let's go on to the next slide. Um, before I do that, let me, let me give you a little bit of a sense about uh, the scale of these organizations, and we'll start specifically talking about some of the things they did. Uh, there, in 1910, there are about 10,000 separate fraternal societies. There are about 100,000 lodges, probably more. That's what we know. That's what was counted. We're talking about a conservative estimate of maybe a third of the adult male population and I'm not going to have an opportunity to talk about it, but there were also female fraternal societies, 
Uh, women in these organizations did not call themselves members of sororial societies. They said we are in fraternal societies as in life, liberty, and fraternity, meaning a sense of community, if you like, that transcended geographical boundaries. Right? So they would call themselves fraternal societies. Now, one of the great untold stories in American history courses uh, is the role of black fraternal societies, because I want to focus today on how these groups were involved in fighting poverty. Right? So the group that, uh, one of the groups that is most dis dis likely to be disproportionately poor uh, at this time are blacks. And fraternal societies are extremely popular among immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe, but blacks are right there at that level. Whites, native whites, lag behind somewhat. In fact, people often write about this. They talk about uh, blacks are lodge mad, you know, using expressions like that. They're forming lodges all of the time with no real previous experience of this kind of thing. They take to them very quickly and are forming fraternal societies. And for either every leading uh, white organization, you often have a black organization of the same name. I'll give you a sense of the, the numbers we're talking about here. The Odd Fellows, the black version of the Odd Fellows in 1904 had 285,000 members. That's one group out of a black population of about 10 million. Just one organization. So these groups are being formed everywhere by some extremely poor people. Because if we're talking about the poverty rate overall, 40%, the black poverty rate, you know, you're talking more like 70, 80%, if not higher than that. And uh, black societies often stress business investment. So part of the flexibility that people have in, this is in American society at this time and an absence of sort of government controls is they can form these groups for all sorts of purposes. And they certainly form them for social welfare, in insurance, uh, for uh, sickness insurance and life insurance, but they also form them to encourage business investment. Example is a group called the Independent Order of St. Luke, and the head of this organization is a woman, even though it's both men and women are in it, and her name is Maggie Walker, and they form a number of businesses, including a uh, bank, they have a bank, they have a hotel, they have a, a newspaper, they have a department store that they start, and the woman that's head of this group for like 30 years is Maggie Walker, and as a result of uh, heading the group, she is also president of their bank, which makes her the first woman, black or white, to be a bank president. Uh, there's a social side to these organizations. It's key to these organizations. It's not the only thing, because if they just have the social side, they don't have enough, but you certainly see that with the fancy drill teams that a lot of these groups have. And one, here's an example of one of these, the Knights and Daughters of Tabor. So, they certainly are providing financial benefits, but at the social side is part of the attraction, and it's all interrelated with each other. All right, let's go on to the next one. Now, these groups are insuring, providing insurance on a mass scale. And one thing that you can say about the progressives at the turn of the century is they did a lot of studies. Um, they, they weren't quite you know, doing it like we have now, like I said, where you know what the unemployment rate is and all this stuff all the time. But they were doing studies, and they did these studies of neighborhoods where they would go down to the block level in big cities and elsewhere, and they would ask people, do you own insurance, do you belong to a lodge, and that kind of thing. And what they found was, what should we see, blacks and immigrants, uh, blacks typically... 90% of black families had at least one life insurance policy. 90%. Now, then these amounts were pretty small, enough to pay for a funeral, plus a little bit more. 90% in a population that would be 70% under the poverty line. Paying these dues to organizations, and of course they're getting a lot of this insurance as well from commercial companies, and they often would have to pay on a weekly basis. Right? The, the, someone would come around to collect the money. 90%. And we talk about the black family and everything. What does that say about the strength of the family that you're able to maintain that? They're also more likely to own health insurance as well. 
Immigrant groups from Eastern and Southern Europe typically are 90% or more. Uh, Native-born whites in many of these studies, they were done in Chicago and el elsewhere, typically, you know, we're talking about wage earners, we're talking about poor people. So we're not just talking even about the entire black population, these are studies that would focus on wage earners and low-income people. Uh, Native-born whites typically more, you know, 85% or so would own life insurance. So they're very effective at spreading this habit of owning insurance, which is extremely important because the ideal in the society, even for blacks, is for the uh, woman to be, uh, de you know, depending on the husband as the bread breadwinner. And when he dies, this is the way that, you know, that, they, that the woman can help tide over um, the situation. Okay, now um, let's go on to the next point. So they're doing life insurance. They do sickness insurance, which we could talk about, which is, which is basically you get a cash stipend for every week that you're sick. And we could talk about how that worked because the societies had some fascinating ways to deal with the issue of what uh, we call today moral hazard issues. They were able to provide this kind of sickness insurance on a significant scale. But around the turn of the century, you're starting to see societies expand out and do more and more services. Uh, some of them I haven't really mentioned. Uh, orphanages, fraternal societies often as a benefit of membership if the children of members were orphaned, they would provide orphanages and they would raise the children until they were 18. Uh, the Masons had orphanages in virtually every state. The Odd Fellows did. Um, I studied uh, one that was run by the Loyal Order of Moose uh, and it had one of the largest orphanages in the country called Mooseheart. Um, and uh, they had homes for the elderly, they had employment bureaus, exchange bureaus, that kind of thing. But after the turn of the century, they increasingly move into the area of, of health care. And before I talk about uh, this example, let me sort of give you an example of some even earlier forms of health care. One thing they start doing in the late 19th century is a system called lodge practice. And that is where the societies sometimes will band together, sometimes it's just one organization, will hire doctors to provide care for the members. And usually what they did was uh, they would pay the doctor on the, on the basis of the size of the membership. So if you had 1,000 members, the doctor would, would get a, a stipend, a, you know, a flat fee, and in return would provide basic primary care, including minor surgery in many cases, for the members. This would include house calls, uh, typically. So it would also include house calls. And um, let me see if I can give you a sense of what we're talking about here, because I had some stats on this. Yeah, um, how much would you pay, all right, if you were a member for this service of lodge practice, where you could call a doctor any time of the day, have them come to your house, right, and check you out. Typically, you would pay one to two dollars a year for that. Now, factor in inflation, what is two dollars? in 1910 versus two dollars in 2010. Well, if you would you know, go to that inflation calculator, forty-five dollars a year. That's typically what you would pay. This took a major foothold in urban areas and part of the reason it, it, it was big but it could have been even bigger is that in general it was pretty cheap to go to a doctor during this time, you know, just if you just paid out of pocket. But give you a sense of how important these organizations were, Lower East Side of New York they had 500 doctors who had contracts just with Jewish lodges, lodge practice contracts. New Orleans, right? Somebody should write about the contrast between New Orleans now and 100 years ago because New Orleans had one of the richest traditions of black mutual aid organizations. This was in the 1920s after these groups had sort of crested. 600 societies, black societies in New Orleans, had a doctor that they hired to provide care for the members. They also cooperatively had lodge undertakers <laughs> that they would hire undertakers uh, collectively and uh, they would hire uh, druggists as well. And they had this sort of cooperative system. This is New Orleans. So you had the system of lodge practice. But over time, these organizations uh, started to provide um, more um, elaborate forms of health care. And an example of this 
was tuber uh, how they dealt with the issue of tuberculosis. I mean, you're talking about catastrophic care, right? Uh, that's an issue, right? I mean, basic care is pretty cheap. Most people don't even go to hospitals, don't even use hospitals. But you had this major medical problem that uh, took a lot of money to deal with. And that was the wave of tuberculosis, also called the white plague. And it just spread, and people just weren't sure how to treat it. And every family was hit by it. It was a massive problem. And the best method of treatment that was available was uh, sanitariums. And that is, you know, it's a pretty expensive thing. You've got to go off to the sanitarium, stay there. You've got a special diet. You've got plenty of rest. It's got to be in a drier climate typically. And so a lot of these societies start to build tuberculosis sanitariums where if the member gets tuberculosis, as a, a benefit of membership, they can go to the sanitarium. This is the one of the modern woodmen of America in Colorado. Those small little buildings are called cure cottages where the member would just sort of lay out there and you know, get rest and that kind of thing. And each one of these would, you know, would have the name of the lodge written over the top of the cottage. And they, right there you have a hospital attached to it, a big hospital, right? And thousands of people received care over the years in this particular uh, sanitarium. So it became more elaborate, providing other kind, trying to deal with this issue of catastrophic care. Lodge practice is dealing with, you know, just getting checked out by your primary care physician, basically, is what it was, right? Go on to the next one, please. You're starting to get societies build hospitals. And one of the groups that does some of the more interesting experiments, and actually later experiments, were blacks again. And uh, uh, one hospital that I wrote a little bit about my, in my book called For Mutual Aid of the Welfare State, and I also wrote a biography of the guy that was chief surgeon of the hospital, who was a kind of a, um, had very strong liberty, uh, uh, libertarian instincts, I guess you could say. His name is Dr. T.R.M. Howard. Fascinating story to this guy. But he was the first chief surgeon at this thing. But one of these hospitals was opened in 1942, and it was called the Taborian Hospital. And it lo was located smack dab in the middle of the Mississippi Delta which is where most blacks in Mississippi lived. Again, then as well as now, Mississippi was the place where you have the highest poverty rates in the country. And there's a group called the Knights and Daughters of Tabor. I showed you the picture earlier. They are a black fraternal society. And the head of the group says, during the 1930s, they decided to build a hospital. And they literally built it brick by brick. And it was finished in 1942. And the size of the Knights and Daughters just in Mississippi went all the way up to 50,000 by 1945, so people could get, you know, the primary attraction would be the hospital. What are you talking about here? Well, it's been described to me as the time it opened is a state-of-the-art facility. Now, it went downhill later, and I think we can talk about why that happened. But it was a hospital where um, you had major and minor surgery, yeah, they would uh, have uh, trained surgeons. They later relied on doctors from a Harry Medical School, one of the two main, or the two only really black medical schools in the country. And typically, in the 1940s, well, not typically, what you would pay it as an adult was $8 a year to get these facilities of the hospital. That would be about $95 now. Uh, what would that entitle you to in the hospital? 30 days of care. Uh, in the hospital, right? So, uh, again, who are members of this organization? Primarily, you're talking about sharecroppers, right? Now, you have, you, it's a multi-class group. These groups are multi-class, but the bulk of the members would be people that would be uh, sharecroppers, that kind of thing. And the hospital uh, uh, provides care to over 160,000 patients during its 20 years of existence. It finally uh, goes out of existence. It's basically regulated to death by the State Hospital Commission. And ultimately, it's taken over by the federal government, part of the Great Society, and uh, 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 closes after that in you know, disgrace, basically. <laughs> we can talk about all that. But this gives you a sense of this hospital. There were, there were many others in the United States like this. Go on to the next one, please. All right, now, I, I don't know how much time I have. I'll try to 
try to keep it, keep it uh, on schedule because I know you're getting, getting hungry and want to have some time for questions. But this isn't really mutual aid, although you did have mutual aid societies involved in this kind of thing. It was primarily something that the private insurance companies did. Well, all right. Um, now, the worst thing you could do is sort of take from my lecture, there was some sort of one best system. Uh, Americans didn't think that way. Like I said, about a third, maybe more of the population belonged in lodges. But even people that were in lodges typically also had commercial insurance policies. They had a range of different things that they used to, uh, to provide uh, uh, services in case they were down and out. A lot of companies had what they called establishment funds, which were like mutual aid societies that would be tied to particular companies. You had some employer-based care. You had, you, know, you had a wide range of things. But the most popular form of insurance in the United States by 1905 of commercial insurance, you're talking about, uh, oh, I'm not sure what you're talking about in terms of numbers, but uh, millions of people, was a form of insurance, I think I have figures here, called tontine insurance. And it's very interesting, I want to talk about it a little bit because we, we, we have big debates now about Social Security. What about the elderly? This was the primary method of uh, saving for the elderly. It was the primary method of old age insurance before 1905. Has anyone ever heard of it before? Okay, some of you have heard of tontine insurance. Well, okay, the way it worked was typical tontine would be, let's say we all decide uh, that we're all going to chip in a dollar a year to a fund and we all say 20 years from now divide up that fund and only people that were original members of the fund can divide up the kitty which could include investments and that kind of thing could just put it in the bank and we divide it up and only the survivors uh, can do it and tontines were used for all sorts of things in fact uh, the stock exchange was originally built through a tontine method and typically they go for 10, 20, 30 years. Well, somebody in the late 19th century had the bright idea of combining standard life insurance with a tontine, which meant that part of your premium would go to maintain a regular life insurance policy, right? And then part of your premium would go into a fund called a, ta you know, a tontine fund. They called it deferred dividend insurance. And typically these would run for 20 years, all right? And then the only people that would have a claim on the fund were original members, right? However, if you died before the end of the 20 years, your family, you know, just like now, would be the beneficiaries of your life insurance policy. So it was a way to combine them together. And basically the way they did it is you have something called the dividend that is um, insurance companies tend to charge a little bit more than they need to for safety's sake, and there's a, that is called the dividend, and usually it's too much, and that'll be returned to the policymaker uh, you know, on an annual basis. Well, at the time, you could plow that into this fund. You could defer it, and it becomes extremely important. There's a very fascinating article writ written about it by Richard Ransom and Roger Such for the Journal of Economic History. I highly recommend it to you. This was the leading form of individual uh, retirement, leading kind of re individual retirement account. Um, give you a sense of how important it is. Okay, one out of every two Americans in 1906 had a tontine insurance policy. One out of every two. One out of every two Americans. 1906, why do I have the figure from then? Well, that's pretty much the last year when it could, new policies can be sold legally in the United States. What happens to tontine insurance? There is an insurance investigation by a state insurance commission in New York. Bad luck there. You know, that's where all the insurance companies, or many of them, are based. And they did an investigation because there were accusations that were, there were insurance executives living high off the hog and pay, being paid these high salaries and that kind of thing. They looked into it, and even though they found no real evidence, they no, found no evidence at all, no one disputes this, that tontine insurance was actuarially unsound or was not a paying proposition, you know, putting money into a savings insurance account. You know, you didn't do as well as, you, as if you put it into a tontine insurance account. So it was a, a good investment, 
But there were all these accusations, and there was also a rent-seeking story because a lot of insurance companies were late and didn't start selling these things, and they only sold standard life insurance company, and they wanted to shut these guys down. And so there was that element. They called it life insurance cannibalism. Some of them made this moralistic argument, and they called it gambling. You said, well, you're just going to benefit if other people die. That's not what life insurance is for. Life insurance should be selfless, right? should just be for your family. So they were making that kind of argument that insurance should not be this investment thing, and it's, uh, you know, they were making that kind of, it's gambling and the rest of it, even though it was actuarially sound. And what they got is a law to require all dividends to be returned on an annual basis, which wiped it out. I mean, they, they honored the existing policies, but no new policies of tontine insurance could be sold. So here you have a system of individually, pur individually purchased retirement insurance, right? not tied to jobs, not tied to the state, actuarially sound, that is shut down. Uh, and it's not just this New York investigation, this is a wave of investigation, so the other states start investigating it. They do the same thing, and there are all these, quote, exposés that come out, and a lot of ambitious politicians. The guy that's head of this commission is Charles Evans Hughes, who later runs for president, later governor of New York, and it's, it's shut down, and it's forgotten. Even a lot of historians that write about the history of, of uh, Social Security and of pensions don't even know about tontine insurance, or really haven't looked much into it at all. So that, for some fraternal societies did do tontine insurance, especially in Britain and Australia. But this was primarily commercial companies, but people would you know, belong to a lodge for sick benefits and do this, perhaps, for retirement insurance. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, now, um, fast forward, I guess, to discuss uh, what, what has happened, the contrast between um, uh, 2000, uh, 1910 and 2010. Well, one thing that we've certainly seen is the growth of the welfare state. And this gives you, this is a rather interesting chart here, which gives you a sense of what we're talking about just since 1929, right? This is in real dollars, the growth of the welfare state. These are means-tested programs, right? These are geared, you know, we're talking about means-tested, geared towards the poor in terms of uh, the amount. So the welfare state has very much uh, intruded itself. Let's go on to the next one. And you get an interesting uh, thing here called the poverty spending paradox. If you go back to the previous one, go to the previous one, the spending is, uh, 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 really starts to, to increase in a major way, as you can see there. See uh, the fourth one over, you can't really read it, around 1970. That's when the spending for the Great Society, which is fully funded by Republicans, Nixon uh, fully funds it really, kicks in around that time. And let's go to the next one here. And what do we see here? Uh, poverty rates, the poor were largely lifting themselves out of poverty till about that time, and the poverty rate reached bottom in 1970 of 10.7%, and it's been stuck ever since. Now it's up to 14.7%. So this is, uh, Charles Murray calls this the poverty spending paradox. You can almost see when does the big money kick in? The progress stops. You have massive decline in poverty here. It starts in 1950. Look at that. From 30% all the way down to about 10%. Then the money kicks in for the great society in a big way, and you stagnate. In fact, you go up a little bit. So let's go on. So what you're getting here with this rise of the welfare state is the decline of what Edmund Burke called the little platoon. Edmund Burke said that fraternal societies were, he called them little platoons, these voluntary associations, you got thousands of them. If you were to look at the poorest areas of America in 1910, these groups were all over the place. And this was often commented upon by progressives like Jane Addams. She has a very interesting um, uh, description of these societies and how they just had these parades and you saw them everywhere, and she said this is wonderful enthusiasm. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a government health insurance uh, program and we could 
channel this enthusiasm into it. That was her argument. And you find that kind of, isn't this great? This is wonderful. So some of the progressives appreciated this, and they thought, well, you know, we can, we can tap into this stuff in a major way. So this is one of the stories of the 20th century, I guess you could say, is the decline of these little platoons, these, these small little societies that really form the infrastructure of society in many ways, have all sorts of spillover effects, right, that go beyond just providing particular services. One reason why this has happened, and, and, and it's a simple answer, I guess, and it's, it's undeniable, is the growth of the welfare state. Because if you take away incentive, you took, you're doing that. Um, and uh, a lot of people say, well, how can we bring back mutual aid? And I can, I'll, I'll give you some thoughts, I guess, about that. I'm mystified by the idea as well. But I would say you get rid of the welfare state. Now, <laughs> uh, because you want to give people a motivation to, to get together, especially poor people, and form these organizations. And an uh, example would be blacks after the Civil War had no previous experience with these societies, but because they needed to provide services, including schools and that kind of thing, they formed um, these fraternal societies. How much time do I have left, or do I got to close it up here? You gotta close it up. All right, I'll close it up now. I was going to go on and make some suggestions and all that, but I'm sort of out of my element there anyway, but I'll open it up for questions. Okay. Yeah, back there. That's it. In the 1970s, there was a book that the J.C. put out called What People for Themselves Can Do. It was about five organizations, community social services, and the computer to comparable government services and show that the private community services cost a fraction of the government. So my question is, would it be possible to do a book like that today with what's going on today? And if so, why aren't any of the libertarians making a sponsoring book like that? Oh, I think it would be very possible, and I, you know, I've sort of moved away from this topic. But I mean, I think there are all sorts of fascinating experiments going on, especially among in the immigrant communities. You often look, have to look under the radar screen. One of the reasons that blacks were able to maintain these hospitals for so long is that regulators didn't care about them. They just sort of said, ah, you know, we don't want to bother with them. You know, let them, we don't want them on charity. We don't want to pay for their uh, health care. And they left them alone. And then they really start to crack down in the 70s. Um, but I think there's a crucial issue here about the poor. And um, that's the problem, right, when you're talking about, you know, the welfare issue. And to give you an example, the Loyal Order of Moose had this very successful orphanage called Moose Heart. And their membership, actually a lot of the fraternal groups lost members. They actually gained members for a long time. And in the 1990s, at that time, I think they'd fallen back. They had more members than they ever had before, and they had their orphanage. And they always had people wanting to get in the orphanage, right? But by that time, they were down to like a couple hundred. And they were willing to do more, but the thing is their members no longer demanded it. Uh, their members were more middle class, more upper class, or... or in many cases, would turn to government programs and that kind of thing. So they actually had to go out and become sort of a charitable, rather than a mutual aid organization, actually find at-risk children and that kind of thing to come into it, even though their membership had gone up. So that's the sticky wicket, right? What do you do about the fact that these groups are no longer big in poor communities? Um, now, I don't know what the future would bring, and I don't know if these groups would come back, but I think something like them might come back, given an incentive structure which is lacking, which isn't just the welfare state, it's a wide range of things, including uh, regulations on property which keep up prices. One of my projects, I'm, I'm actually head of the, I'm a, I'm a federal official, I'm head of the uh, State Advisory Committee of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights for Alabama, and we've been looking into the destruction of black homes in Montgomery. They're, they're, they're demolishing black homes, not just black, but poor people, but tend to be in black neighborhoods, uh, for, you know, making the argument that they're eyesores or whatever. Um, and, you know, you've got all sorts of things like this building code, you've got all sorts of controls that make it really hard for a poor person to kind of get ahead where it was much easier 100 years ago because you had this wide range of experimentation. So it's all sort of interconnected, I guess. Yeah. 
We're out of time. I'm sorry. I drowned on too long. Okay, well, thank you very much.